In the latest crisis to strike the Fukushima nuclear power plant in Japan, operator Tokyo Electric made the discovery that 300 tons, that's the equivalent of 72,000 gallons of highly radioactive water, leaked into the ground. Now, how serious is this? Let's take a look at the latest news. In its worst nuclear leak to date, Tokyo Electric Power Company announced about 300 tons of radioactive water has leaked from one of its hundreds of storage tanks. The Japanese nuclear watchdog said that it was taking the leakage of highly radioactive water at the crippled Fukushima nuclear power plant seriously and proposed raising the rating to describe it from an anomaly to a serious incident. TEPCO has not yet figured out how or from where the water leaked. The leak, the fifth since last year involving tanks of the same design, also raised concerns that this could be the beginning of a new disaster, contaminated water leaking from storage tanks one after another. A spokesman for the Nuclear Regulation Authority said the agency is debating whether to use an international scale for radiological releases to upgrade the severity of the crisis from a level one anomaly to a level three serious incident. The watchdog urged TEPCO to step up monitoring for leaks and take precautionary measures. The plant, crippled by an earthquake and tsunami in 2011, has seen a series of water leaks and power failures. We welcome back Dee Dee Benke, Dr. Bard and Jackie Guzda, and also welcome via Skype Dr. Ken Bissler, who is a senior scientist at Woods, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And Dr. Uh, Bissler, we want to, first of all, get an overview from you about how serious this situation is. As we just heard, it's been upgraded to a level three, but just how serious is this? Well, you have to put it in context of what was going on two and a half years ago. When that initial accident happened, there were explosions there was direct uh, water flowing from reactor buildings into the ocean. So it's certainly not as severe as two years ago. Yet the character, the isotopes that are being released today are somewhat different. In some ways, different isotopes that have different health effects, so maybe more dangerous. And we have this long persistent leak now that has also different attributes. It can continue to get into the system, into the ocean, into the sediment seafloor, and into the biota, the seafood. I know you've uh, personally done some research there, um, Dr. Bissler. If you could explain this to people who really don't understand, if you could compare, compare like Fukushima to Chernobyl, because there's been so much, there's been so many people and alarmists that are so, so concerned about this, but can you sort of put it into context as compared to Chernobyl? Yeah, we have to remember there have been other accidents. Chernobyl in some ways, well, it was a larger accident, the total release, but for the ocean, since Fukushima is right on the ocean, there's a more direct release to the ocean. Now, the way those winds blow in Japan, primarily offshore, and the way the water was being directly impacted, in fact, about 80 to 90 percent of the radioactivity went into the ocean. In some ways, that was good news for Japan because when you live in an area that's contaminated, well, that radioactivity is under your feet. It gets in your food products. When it gets in the ocean, quickly it gets moved offshore with the ocean currents. So when we were there in June of 2011, it was safe for us to be there, our health and safety, we were monitoring actually. But uh, what's been happening over time is the concern on the ocean side is for uptake into fish and then consumption. So they've closed down fisheries and they don't allow fish to be taken and sold commercially either in Japan or elsewhere. So on the water side, we're not as worried about direct exposure. The level three concern from the leaky tanks on land is because if you stand next to that liquid, you can get a very high dose of radiation. Well, Dr. Bissler, we certainly want to uh, check in with you in just a minute about uh, ways that, there, you know, in solutions to this tragedy overseas. But Dr. Bart, I'm going to turn to you right now and ask you, when you do have something like this, a tragedy like this, and you, you have countries like the U U.S. on the West Coast that are now alarming the bell that they may be in danger. There's people that were going out and getting iodide tablets. How do you, how do you explain and try, try to right. calm those fears right now? Well, I think there's legitimate fear when it comes to nuclear energy. I mean, there's a question mark over this whole source of energy. And I think that it's even becoming a bigger question because we have green energy now that's looking like it, it's on the horizon. It's really on the horizon. It's not going to be next week, but it's going to happen. So to really allay some of these fears, I think we really need to go down a road where we say, you know, we're going to be looking at nuclear power in the rearview mirror someday. This is going to be ancient 
technology. The new technology in the new world is going to be green. And I think people, if they can understand where society will go, I think they're going to feel a lot better. I want to, I want to go back to addressing the fears, though, because I know, I know you like that green energy. I um, do. And, and I do, too. But, uh, Didi, what are your thoughts on uh, nuclear I think energy. nuclear power is great. I think that it seems like Japan, they have uh, issues that other places don't, perhaps because of the tsunamis, because of earthquakes. I mean, maybe it's not a good place for nuclear energy with Japan, but in other parts of the world, it's working. It's working in our country, and it's making energy uh, prices go down. Green energy, I disagree, Dr. Barr. I, I don't see it on the horizon. I think that we need to use nuclear energy. We need to use oil, and we need to use what we have right now. And nuclear energy is good. Yeah, there are problems in Japan, but there have also been studies about how they, they didn't plan correctly. So perhaps they can look at neighbors who are getting it right in other countries and do a better job. Or maybe with the geological forces there and where it is, I mean, maybe it's just not a good place for nuclear energy, but it is in other parts of the world. Uh, Dr. Bissler, we want to weigh in on you on, on some of the solutions uh, for, for what Japan is facing right now. What, what should they be doing? I mean, should this uh, be processed and then dumped it back into the Pacific, this water that is already found to be radioactive? Well, when you say processed... Anything they can do to remove the radioisotopes is a good thing. So then these leaks aren't as severe. And they're temporarily holding this water. That's going to be years, though, before some of this technology is ready for them to extract all of the isotopes. They've taken cesium out of these liquids. They're cooling waters that are being stored now for the removal of strontium-90 and other isotopes. That's kind of the big worry now is the strontium-90 getting out into the system. And once the tanks or buildings leak, that will get in the groundwater that groundwater will flow naturally into the ocean. So engineering-wise, it's very hard to like put a dam up to stop groundwater flow uh, because, in fact, it'll go around, it'll go over uh, around the sides. So they're going to have a water problem, a water management problem, because of all the water going in the buildings, whether they put dams up or not. And they're going to have to come up with engineering solutions to remove some of these more dangerous levels of radionuclides before anything can be done or talked about releasing that type of water. Well, in, in terms of just the, the, the laymen, the people that are over on the West Coast, uh, Dr. Bissler, is there any need for panic at this moment? No, I'm, I, was there, I was there myself in May. We were in the water much, much closer <laughs> than the West Coast. It was safe to be there. The levels only go down as you move further away. Now, people ask me about fish. Fish swim, not very many that far, but like the bluefin tuna. They've actually analyzed the tuna samples off San Diego, Yes, you can see traces of cesium in them, both from 1960s weapons testing and the new accidents, but they're at levels that are far, far lower than are considered dangerous. So from the measurements I've seen, the knowledge of the ocean currents and the whole ecology of these fish, there's really no concern on our side of the ocean. It's a coastal concern off Japan, though. That's quite real. And we'll just get your personal thoughts, uh, folks, about um, living near a nuclear power plant. I wouldn't want to live next to one. And I, and I think that there is, your, your point is a good one about fear. There's no solution in terms of a psychologist answering the question in terms of what we do about it unless we go into a different direction. Because how many more incidents are we, do we need before we put a bigger question mark on, on nuclear energy? I know Didi may like it, and in some ways it works. It works for, for France, but suppose there's another big incident in the next year or two. When are we going to be over that line and say it's, it's, it's really dangerous? Jackie, what do you think? See, the incidences that have to do with nuclear energy are not small incidences. They're not a car accident. Right. They are huge. And we know the names, and they strike fear in our memories. There's Chernobyl. There's Three Mile Island. I myself am in favor of nuclear en uh, energy. I do not want nuclear energy plants put on a fault line, and I personally do not want to live next to I think that's a problem. One. I think it's where it is. I think Japan, they, that, may, they may need to get rid of the nukes. Well, that's it's one of the other things that they said when Fukushima first went up. But I do not want to live next door to one just in case there is one of those huge accidents. Well, I want to get some final thoughts from uh, Dr. Bissler. And uh, Dr. Bissler will ask you as well, uh, just your personal thoughts on living close to a nuclear power plant. Well, I kind of agree. There, there are good and wrong places to put some of these things. And that holds for any energy source. So. We have an issue in our town with wind turbines too close to some of the homes. Uh, so there are things we can do better, certainly, uh, in terms of siting these. We have one off Cape here, Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant. Uh, the issue is somewhat the extension of those licenses. How safe are they? I'm not an expert in that, so I'm not going to comment on that particular site. But uh, as we've seen, the consequences when something goes wrong are, are quite large, and not just 
locally, actually, it's in some ways a, a bigger concern on land uh, than for those of us who study the oceans. Well, I certainly appreciate your time. I know you're a very busy man, Dr. Bissler, and uh, th certainly appreciate your expertise and for being on the show today. Uh, final thoughts from our panel. I'm happy to live uh, close to a nuclear plant because it keeps uh, energy prices low, and I'd rather do that than spend n waste millions of dollars on projects like Solyndra that fail. Jackie? There are millions of other projects besides Solyndra <laughs> that have been successful when it comes to green energy, and that's the future. It's best for America. All right, Dr. Burt. The, the future is going to be green. It's not going to be <laughs> nuclear. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that, Dr. Burt, and I respect that as well. All right, don't go away, everyone. We will be speaking about Obamacare next. The Affordable Health Care Act goes into effect October 1st. Are you ready? And is corporate America.